Hello. Good morning to um, to all of you. A very warm welcome to today's session about G3PLC. Um, I hope you can hear me. I can see my fellow panelists, and I hope all attendees can can hear me. But I'll trust on that. Um, my name is Leon Vergeer, and I'm the General Secretary of the G3 PLC Alliance. And under normal circumstances, uh, we would now be in African Utility Week promoting G3 PLC. But as the conference has been postponed, we are very glad we have this opportunity today to talk with you online. And for today's webinar, we specifically invited representatives from utilities in Africa to answer any general or technical questions um, you may have regarding G3PLC. And we are very pleased that we have uh, representatives from eight different countries uh, in Africa joining us today. So that's very nice. Thank you very much for that. And um, first of all, let's move to um, uh, other people joining me in the session today. That is Marc Delandre from Enegis in France and Cédric Lavenu from EDF R&D. Um, Marc, Cédric, could you please briefly introduce yourself, please? Hello, good morning, uh, everybody. I am Marc Deland from uh, Enedis. I have been working within Enedis for an EDF group for over uh, 30, uh, 30 years. And I am also the chairman of the G3 uh, PLC Alliance. And I will be pleased to give you some information about uh, G3 PLC in the world, in France, and to answer your question. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, everybody. So my name is Cédric Levenu. Uh, I'm expert research engineer at EDF R&D, uh, which is a company I joined about more than 10 years ago. And I've been always working in the field of power line communication, also other telecommunication solutions, and uh, involved in different uh, standard organizations, and more specifically, GTPLC Alliance, uh, as a chair of the technical working group. Thank you. Welcome to okay, it. Thank you. And as I already mentioned, hey, my name is Leon Vergeer. Uh, I started working for the G3 PLC Alliance in 2014 in setting up the uh, certification program for the Alliance. And before that, I worked with uh, utilities in the Netherlands. Um, Let me see. Um, in this uh, webinar today, we, we planned a discussion around three topics. Um, I will start explaining in general about G3PLC and the G3PLC Alliance. And then Mark will tell you about uh, mass rollout of G3PLC uh, smart meters in France. And after that, Cedric will explain about performance enhanced grid operations and uh, hybrid PLC RF communication we are developing. Um, we received quite some questions from many of you uh, before the webinar, so thank you very much for that. And in this presentation, we will also address uh, these questions uh, right away. Um, if you have any questions during the discussion, please post them in the webinar tool then we will try to answer them um, in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And if you want, you can post your questions in France, as we have, uh, as you know, had two people from, uh, uh, from France. And um, after the webinar, we will also share with all of you by email the presentation we made um, today. Um, and um, we plan to start, we plan to finish um, at um, six, oh no, uh, in one hour, um, so it's 12 your time. 
So let me first start with um, a general introduction to G3PLC. G3PLC was developed from the start for mass rollout of smart meters and specifically for the 35 million smart meters in Enedis in France. So G3PLC has been designed to work in challenging noisy grid environments. Um, a number of characteristics are summarized here in this, in this figure. It's, it's a cost-effective technology because DSLs use their own infrastructure for telecommunication. Uh, there were no telecom fees to be paid and there is no dependency on telco operators. Um, it's an open ITU standard. In 2012, the specification was published by ITU as an official international standard and it's being used worldwide currently. Um, G3PLC embeds all modern features for long-term network operation, eh, for example, including IPv6, high robustness. Um, it operates at different modulations depending on the conditions in the network and it's, it's self-healing technology and we'll further talk about that later. Um, secure, it has state-of-the-art security. G3PLC embeds all features to ensure confidentiality and integrity like authentication, encryption and anti-replay mechanisms. On the right side, you see a couple of applications for G3PLC. The main application is still smart metering, but G3PLC is also being used in other applications such as street lighting, home automation, uh, in railway control systems and, and several other industrial applications. So the benefits in general of G3PLC are there is, there is no dependency on telcos. It's low cost as you use your own grid. Um, it facilitates long range communication. It has high indoor penetration and it enables enhanced grid operation because uh, as a PLC technology, it is naturally connected to your grid. And we will come back to that um, later in the presentation. Um, the G3PLC Alliance, it's a non-profit organization founded in 2011. Um, and it's backed by an international group of DSOs and industrial players to ensure uh, continuity and evolution of G3PLC technology. And currently we have over 90 members in the Alliance. Um, one of the most recent new members is uh, the company called ST, which is, a, which is the main utility in Latvia in Eastern Europe. And they are installing 1 million G3PLC meters in their, in their grid at the moment. Um, and these are all the logos of all the member companies. Um, G3PLC is a mature technology. Currently, we have over 50 million devices in the field all over the world. As I mentioned, it's an open standard, so anybody can use it. Um, our members, they often compete in the market, so they do not always want everybody to know where they do pilots and rollouts in the world with G3PLC. So, as G3PLC Alliance, we do not know all the implementations there are over the world. But on the map here, you can see the, the pilots and rollout we, we, we do now. Um, we have a strong certification program, which opened in 2014. And certification guarantees yeah, that certified products actually implemented G3PLC, and they are conformed to the standard. Certification guarantees that the product is interoperable with other certified products, and that the product meets specified performance levels. And up to now, we are running the certification program for five years, and we have almost 400 different um, certified devices, which are all listed on the G3PLC website. Now, one of the questions 
asked before the webinar was how does the future look like for G3 PLC? Um, well, like I mentioned already, have, we have an active group of members who are continuously working on technological enhancements of G3 PLC, so the technology keeps evolving. Um, we work hard to further increase application of G3 PLC in smart metering, for example, in Asia, Eastern Europe, and of course, it will be, we hope it will be widely used in Africa. And also, we will focus in near future on, uh, on, on application in South America. Besides metering, we will further develop applications uh, in other areas like street, light, like street lighting, uh, industrial automation, uh, and railway applications. And then another important next step for G3 PLC is developing a hybrid PLC RF solution to maximize the coverage of the technology and to open up new use cases. And we will also talk about that uh, in more detail a little bit later. So G3 PLC is a proven and robust technology, uh, but we keep evolving and expanding globally. Um, now let's let's take a first look at a few of the questions which were already shared before the webinar. Um, this is the first one. There was a question about um, what features are built into G3 PLC um, to, to overcome EMI in power networks and, and what are advantages of G3 PLC over legacy PLC technologies. Um, Cedric, I think you are best equipped to uh, explain about that. Yeah, so basically, um, if um, we have to keep in mind that G2PLC has been designed for noisy networks. So uh, by nature, it integrates a uh, channel correction, uh, error correction mechanism that makes it suitable for harsh channels. Uh, there are two mechanisms in particular I would like to highlight here. Uh, the first one is channel estimation, which is done by uh, neighboring nodes, uh, GTPLC nodes, that will estimate the attenuation and uh, between uh, or to uh, the neighbor node, as well as the noise level uh, it, it, it receives. And, and from, that, uh, from that information, it's then able to basically use the carriers that should be used and not use those that are, for example, uh, and let's say submitted to a too high uh, level of noise. So that is um, that is really a, a very useful functionality to 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 be robust against noise. And of course, the modulation is also adapted uh, with respect to that. You would use more robust modulations <clears throat> where you have strong noise, and you would use faster modulations where uh, the channel conditions are good. In addition, there's also what we call uh, interleaver, um, two-dimensional interleaver. So behind this uh, very technical word, uh, the principle is to say that we would use both um, time and frequency diversity by uh, redone by basically repeating the information in the error code and uh, error correction code uh, to spread it over time and frequency. So when one uh, information is sent, you can always find it at several places in both time and frequency, which makes GTPLC very robust. And uh, these features are advantages GTPLC offers. Okay, I hope that explains a little bit about the uh, advantage of G3PLC in, in, in particular. Um, um, a second question we, we received before the webinar is, um, is regarding FCC band plan usage in, in, in Africa. Um, how, what should African utilities consider uh, when, when, when deciding to deploy FCC? Uh, can you migrate from Senelec A to FCC? And, and uh, what about radiated AMI regarding um, FCC? Um, Cedric, can I ask you again uh -huh. to address that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Leon. So here we are purely in a regulatory uh, on a regulatory question. In Europe, using FCC uh, is not um, um, explicitly authorized, but it's not even explicitly prohibited. So basically, 
uh, when we deploy, for example, FCC in Europe, uh, we just make sure that uh, we do not encounter any uh, regulation issues with local regulators in, in the different countries, uh, in different European countries. And I think that's exactly the same uh, approach um, you should have in Africa to make sure that there is no local rules that would, um, let's say, prohibit you from using the FCC band plan uh, when you, when uh, communicating with PLC signals over of the network so that's really what what should be made clear locally and of course um, there's probably as many regulations as there are countries nevertheless uh, personally I've not heard about any issues up until now of this uh, deployment also, um, my advice would be, of course, to, to use uh, FCC wherever it's possible because it simply offers uh, uh, um, a wider data, a wider data rate that, that than Sentinel-Lake A. Uh, but of course, Sentinel-Lake A is also an option that, that could be considered. In any case, when we talk about migrating from Sentinel-Lake to FCC, if, uh, if this is a scenario or strategy you would like to apply to your local deployment, that um, it's not always possible. Um, it's a question of the meters you would buy to your uh, manufacturer. So DTPLC lines do, do not specify the mechanisms that uh, should be implemented in meters. Nevertheless, I know that some equipment manufacturers could offer this type of features and others do not. So some meters would not, you could not uh, just switch them from Sender A to FCC and you'll probably have to replace them. And some other meters, you may be able to do this switch. So, uh, really, it's a question to make sure with equipment manufacturers whether you have FCC ready options uh, that could be deployed in the future. Um, regarding the EMI cases about FCC, uh, it's also a little bit related with the with the first question of what's the regulation, what the local rules. Uh, to me, I have not heard about any. EMI cases that have been reported for uh, the FCC band plan. Uh, either, uh, I mean, radio services in general in that band uh, might not be affected that much because, of course, um, the, the, uh, the frequencies we use are still uh, have still long wavelength and, and, and the network is not an optimized radiator at these frequencies. So this is really something that should technically not be an issue. And, uh, but of course, again, we have to check with, with, with regulators. <laughs> and in the worst case, it's always possible to turn off some interfering careers thanks to some features, the tone masking feature in the GTPLC standard. So you always have the option to, to go <laughs> that way if, if you need to. Hope that was okay. clear. Yeah, and, and if it's not clear or when you have additional questions, please share them over the webinar, then we can address them uh, right away, hopefully. Um, then one final question before we move to um, the presentation about um, ANADIS in France. Uh, there was a question specifically for South Africa, I think, um, regarding um, customer interface units um, and how they should be connected to the meter for good performance they should have peer-to-peer -peer -peer communication is it possible to have the meter act as a pen coordinator for the customer interface unit and at the same time as a pen device in relation to the to the data concentrator for the um, for the metering um, Cedric, can yeah. I turn to you? Yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, a meter um, is, is a device and here we will talk about uh, the implementation of a PLC modem. So a single G3 PLC modem could only operate either as a PAN device or as a PAN coordinator, right? So an implementation a protocol stack can only have one of the two roles. Nevertheless, uh, a, a meter could also implement two stacks, uh, one uh, being the PAN device and one being the PAN coordinates, like you have two modems. Um, so that's, of course, 
theory uh, that that's of course practice and in theory it could also be possible i think that uh, a manufacturer develops a, a stack that could uh, could be configurable or in real time but i have not known about such implementation so really the message to keep in mind is have two modems in a single device to ensure that you would have this uh, operation um, so that's our recommendation it's also, uh, while we discuss about separating the two paths toward the data concentrator uh, outdoor and the um, custom unit inside uh, the house, uh, it's important uh, also to uh, separate frequencies as much as possible. For example, you could use uh, Senelec A for the communication with the customer interface or Senelec B for example. <coughs> recently issued a new certification program or uh, and basically use FCC to uh, the data concentrator. So you really this this separation would, would allow a much better coordination between the two networks without uh, any uh, interferences. So that's what we recommend. <clears throat> okay, I hope that um, clarified to the audience. Um, then um, let's move to um, to the second part of the um, we want to uh, present it specifically about the rollout of G3 PLC meters in uh, in France. Mark, if you could explain, please. Okay, thank you and thank you, Leon, and uh, good uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I hope you will hear me. And uh, I think uh, that, and I hope that uh, in November it will be able to, will be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting in in uh, South Africa. But today the situation is quite difficult. Uh, regarding the rollout of uh, Linky, Linky is the name of the smart uh, meter uh, in France. It's uh, only a PLC power line communication smart meter. And we have uh, decided to, to replace uh, all the meters in France. That's to say uh, 35 million meters uh, to be in the field uh, before the end of 2021. Uh, uh, we started the massive rollout in December 2015. And it will take uh, six years. Why six years? Because it's a big logistic issue to replace 35 million meters. It means, in average, five to six million meters per, uh, per year. The total estimated cost for the operation is more or less five billion euros. Uh, but it's difficult to compare the cost in France to the cost in any other country. Uh, the main part of the cost in France is due not to the meter itself, but to the cost of the workforce to, to, to set the meter in the field. And thanks to this operation, we have uh, created in France uh, 10,000 jobs uh, partly for the design and the manufacturing of the meters and partly for uh, the operators in the, in the field. We are working with uh, six main uh, partners. You can see them on the slide. And among them, uh, Sagemcom and Landis, uh, Landis and Gear, uh, who are two of our main uh, partners. Uh, Sagemcom is providing uh, both data concentrators and meters, and Landis and Gear is uh, providing uh, meters. We started the, the, the rollout in 2015. It works fine, and uh, it will be a, a very big improvement in the network management, and we will have to manage on a daily basis uh, three billion data tests, sets uh, used uh, not only for um, smart uh, metering, for metering, uh, but also it's a good way to, to develop uh, network uh, services 
the songs to this kind of uh, information. Uh, Leon, can we switch to the next uh, slide, please? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, today we have uh, 24 million meters in the field, working very, very fine. Uh, it's, as I said, it's only a power line communication. Uh, at the beginning, we started with uh, G1, the, the first generation of uh, power line. G1 is uh, SFSK technology, it works fine, but uh, G3 is better, and we decided to switch to, to, to G3 technology. And at the end of the rollout, we will have almost only G3 PLC uh, meters. We have to provide uh, 700 to 800 meters per, uh, per month, and the performance is quite, uh, quite good. Uh, the data collection rate on a daily basis is uh, over 98%, uh, including uh, all the events on the chain, not only the power line, but the GPRS communication between the data concentrator and the head and system. And regarding uh, remote operation, it's almost 100%. It's um, over than 99%. It's quite good, very uh, competitive, and it works fine, whatever the type of network in France, in big cities, in uh, rural areas, in uh, areas close to the sea, in the mountains, and whatever the, the, the weather, it's a very, very robust uh, technology. And even if the level of noise on the network is high, it works fine. So it's a good demonstration. And uh, we can promote, we are proud to promote this technology worldwide. Thank Next, you, Mark. Uh, yes. There was one question, uh, Mark. I hope you can you can address that was uh, what steps should the utility follow for a successful rollout of G3 PLC networks? Um, for example, uh, is it necessary to do uh, noise measurements? So I hope you can address that. Um, what I would uh, recommend, for sure, uh, it's always interesting to make some noise measurements, but. Uh, as uh, Leon said, uh, today uh, G3 PLC is working in over than 30 uh, countries, and we don't have any issue with uh, noise, but you, you can do it. And perhaps you can start with a small, not a POC, but uh, a small uh, test with uh, one or 2,000 meters in the field to double check everything. And uh, to be sure your uh, operators are uh, have the good skills, the right skills to, to do meter installation. Uh, my uh, main recommendation regarding uh, a big uh, rollout, because the big issue is logistics. If you have to install in the field millions of uh, meters, you have to organize uh, everything. Uh, you have to work with um, customer. Customer acceptance may be an issue. And in France, we didn't have any uh, technical issue, but only uh, issue regarding uh, customer acceptance uh, with uh, different types of questions such as um, uh, we have to pay for the smart meter or not, uh, some question about uh, privacy, about security of data and so on. So you have to, to explain uh, everything to, to the customer upfront in advance uh, to, to welcome the, the, the smart uh, meters. Then, uh, regarding the, the rollout by itself, my main uh, uh, technical recommendation would be uh, first to start with the installation of data concentrator, and then, in the second time, install the smart meter. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, as the technology is based on PLC and meters are repeaters, I would recommend to complete as soon as possible an area uh, to be sure to have a very good level of uh, performance. Uh, then regarding noise, it should not be an issue. It works. It works in uh, European countries. It works in China, in other Asian countries. It has been tested in uh, 
different countries in Africa. It works. And uh, regarding the, the frequency band, uh, you could have the question, Cenelec A or, or FCC. And as Cedric say, first, it's a matter of regulation. In France, we have to use uh, Cenelec A, but my uh, recommendation on a technical point of view would be to use uh, FCC because uh, the bandwidth is better, it's more powerful, uh, and regarding noise, it's probably also better. So, recommendation regarding the band FCC for sure. Okay, I hope that answered the question regarding the uh, the rollout specifics of, of G3 PLC. Um, um let's continue i have one question but i'll address that one in the next uh, topic uh, when we talk about performance enhanced grid operations and and the hybrid plc rf i mentioned earlier um so cedric i think this is for you to um explain a little bit further yeah, thank you, Leo. Um, indeed, there's one also topic, a question that was brought up by um, by different attendees. Um, it's the question of how will JTPLC performance, uh, let's say, it depends on the configuration of the network. There's the question, of course, of how many smart meters you have for each DC and probably all the factors such as the geographical distribution of the different nodes over the grid um, so this is clearly to be to be to be looked at and um, what we can first say is that gtplc was designed to handle several hundreds of meters per dc that's perfectly feasible using gtplc as a matter of fact the largest substation energy managers uh, has actually 1200 smart meters it's true that this is a quite, um, let's say, uh, rare case, right? Uh, that they uh, typically, they are, uh, I mean, a, a medium average number would be 50 meters per DC in France, but of course we would have a certain number of substations where you would have 100, 200 meters, even three, four to 600 meters. Um, what I know from that is that uh, you can always, uh, we always have the experience to make GTPLC work either in its default configuration or sometimes for the bigger networks we could eventually tweak it a little bit um, playing on the different uh, attributes. Nevertheless, the Alliance and Workshop 1 in particular is currently working to further improve uh, the performances and more particularly the available bandwidth in dense networks. Um, and I would say the dense networks would really start above 300 meters. Below 300 meters, I would say uh, there is no real issue. Uh, of course, if you have both a lot of meters and a lot of noise, of course, it could be a little bit more challenging, uh, but uh, GTPLC is designed to do that without any, any problems. So um, the recommendations we could still, uh, let's say, issue here is that um, the stack configuration, um, we, sh we should make sure that uh, routing tables have extended uh, time to live, right? Uh, once a route is constructed, you have a routing table entry. Well, it's better to have a 24-hour uh, time to live, for example, then a 30 minutes time to live where you would need to reconstruct the routes every time you kind of interact with one particular meter. Um, it's recommended basically to lower down the number of messages you would need to send to construct this route. So really have as much, uh, 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 the longer time to live, the better it is for the routing table. And the same way, sometimes something that is uh, that is that is forgotten is also that uh, when a smart meter associates with a GTPLC network, it's advised that this meter stays registered to this um, to this pan as long as possible. Also, it would be nice to have maybe uh, two, three, four days of registration active before it eventually decides to to go away from that pan and find another one. 
So that's that, that's a clear recommendation. Also, uh, application process and traffic patterns need to be optimized, uh, right? It's it's for example, uh, if you have 10 messages to send uh, to each one of 100 meters, it's basically better to send 10 messages to meter one than send the 10 messages to meter two and not send one message to meter one, the same message to meter two, three, four, up to 100, and then again, do it again. You would lose a lot of bandwidth doing that. But there are really some engineering tricks uh, we, we need to, to basically uh, use, and this is also partly described in the user guidelines that are currently uh, published by the GTPLC alliance, and namely a player integration with GTPLC. These are some first uh, uh, some first uh, hints. Uh, on the next slide, uh, if we if we can can switch to the next slide. Thank you, Leon. Yep. Um, so also something that is uh, interesting. Um, so it's it's about the registration of the different devices on the DTPLC network. Uh, it's important to avoid any type of um, let's say, uh, simultaneous registration by a big number of nodes uh, towards one uh, PAN coordinator, for example. It's better to randomize uh, the transmission of beacons, which is, by the way, already uh, supported by the GTPLC stack. But outside the scope of the GTPLC standard itself, it's also good that uh, application layers make sure that meters will uh, distribute bootstrapping attempts over time, right? Uh, you want to avoid any type of, of, of bootstrapping storm where you would end up with a lot of messages colliding and, of course, uh, leading to uh, failure uh, and not to be able to communicate with these devices. So the same way we need to back uh, to, to kind of uh, implement backoff mechanisms such as in CSMH channel access, but possibly with durations going from several minutes to several hours, so you make sure that you smoothly into, you smoothly basically um, distribute your, 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 your joining requests. Also, one good thing is please install the data concentrator first and then the meters, which is important. Uh, also, uh, it's important, I, I talked talk before about uh, the, the necessity to maintain registration association over time, so at the application layer, so it's important to maintain these association also during power outages to avoid any uh, re-bootstrapping of the whole network every time you have a, a, a power outage. So this is also very important to have in mind. Um, so the, the next slide, please, Leo. Yeah, yes, absolutely. One, one question came in. You, yes. you mentioned data concentrators. Um, one of the questions, I received is what what is actually better a G3PLC gateway or a G3PLC data concentrator? Actually, it's uh, it's a choice that has to be made with respect to the global network architecture. It's not really a question. It's not really a big. It doesn't make a big difference from the GTPLC side, but it can make a big difference depending on the wide area network infrastructure you have. If you have to uh, manage 35 million meters point to point from the information system using the communication link to the telecommunication operator, for example, towards the data concentrator. It's it could be feasible, but of course you have to make sure that uh, your system scales right with with the with the number of devices you deploy. In France, for example, this choice was not made. In France, and it is chose to. Um, let's say do some local processing with the data concentrator collecting all the meters and then once a day or, or whenever needed if there's more communication needed for some specific commands the information system connects to the data concentrator on the, the different data collected previously by the data concentrator is retrieved and uh, by, the, by the information system right and you can of course uh, in case you need to do an urgent operation, uh, the information system could ask it to the data concentrator at any time, so uh, the the, the, well, the application process is forwarded to the to the meter. Okay, and another question, uh, Cedric, we received. Uh, you mentioned um, the randomization of, of beacon transmissions. Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be controlled by utility engineers? 
so after it's, on, after it has been deployed yeah indeed uh, for the beacon transmission uh, in gtplc uh, the default value is is, is is 12 seconds i think so this is something of course uh, it's an attribute you can change of course the issue is that if you have readers that cannot be associated because um, the the beacons can not come through then you might have a, a, a problem to solve by uh, changing the parameter physically going to the meet and change the parameter maybe with a local communication port but if you have a network that still forms without being forming in an optimized way you could of course change this parameter for better operation next time all right all right i hope that clarified and otherwise uh, we can we, we can answer some questions about that after the webinar maybe in, in more detail um moving on with the presentation cedric yep. um, there was one other question we received up front having to do with the uh, the, the the attributes and settings um for performance i believe so uh, indeed, DLMS Cosm exposes uh, a lot of uh, attributes and settings. So you can do a lot actually remotely. You can change a lot yourself. Nevertheless, um, we we made all our, I mean, all all what was possible to avoid any uh, that that communication breaks if the wrong parameters are used. So, uh, but nevertheless, optimized settings are uh, suggested in user guidelines. We we are in the process of publishing, and also default values that are in the GTPLC spec are in any case recommended. Uh, if of course you need to, you you want to further optimize a GTPLC operation, mm -hmm. uh, you should definitely um, discuss that with your product manufacturer to see what can be tweaked without taking any risk or by avoiding any unexpected behavior but that's of course valid for any technology um it, it, changing parameters is something that that needs to be to be studied quite carefully in the lab you can by the way uh, do a lot you can take a lot of risks try to a lot of different things but once you're in the field uh, it becomes a bit more touchy but you have the ability to configure this uh, so um, also for the routing more particular uh, it's influenced of course by the different uh, key attributes which uh, have an influence on the routing metrics so you could also here change things uh, but again uh, doing it carefully and with uh, manufacturer and possibly and taking into account experience that is has been reported in the user guidelines is recommended in any case. Okay, we um, Cedric mentioned about the user guidelines a couple of times, huh? um, um, and and explained that huh? we we published a couple of user guidelines already, and and some other are in the process of of development. Um, there was one more general user guideline which is available for everybody on our website and i think we will share that with all of you uh, together with the presentation and for some other use guides user guidelines only the um, summary the executive summary is available for non-members um, but for example uh, many manufacturers are member of course of g3plc alliance so they have access to all the um, user guidelines um, for G3PLC and I will share the link as well um, together with the presentation after the uh, after the meeting um, another question Cedric we received before the webinar is about certified products and, and and how they are tested and whether they are all uh, tested in the same way um, an interesting question i think cedric you can probably answer yeah so uh, first of all uh, as already said by leon by mark certification guarantees 
conformance to the standard, interoperability between certified products, and also a specified and minimum performance level that are shared by all the devices certified by the GDPLC Alliance. So they all have the same minimum performance level. And if you want to, to go a bit further in what these performance um, uh, levels are, because manufacturers could have higher performance level than what is uh, expected, you can always ask them for the, the PICS, so PICS, which is a document saying that uh, that's related to the certification and what the results are, or also asking manufacturers for additional information they could provide and why uh, the, the the product of manufacturer A is better than manufacturer B. So that's uh, that's the principle of competition between different manufacturers. But GTPLC Alliance certifies a minimum performance at any in, in any case. Uh, in addition, um, there's some guidance uh, that's provided in the NETSI document, which is that Etsy technical specification 103909. You can find it on Google. It's downloadable, downloadable free of charge, and it, it shows how PLC products could be tested in the lab to understand how they perform. Uh, I mean, with respect to how they handle attenuation, what's the maximum attenuation they could handle, uh, what's the maximum attenuation they could handle also in the presence of noise. Uh, so um, either you have the resources and the willingness to also try to, to do it yourself in, in your lab, or you could also maybe ask manufacturers um, about uh, additional information using ETCTS 103909 performance metrics if you need to get more information in the in the in your RFPs. So that's that's what we can say on, on that on that specific topic. Okay, thank you Cedric. Um, I think that answered um, most of the questions we uh, we received uh, before the webinar and then I think we can move back to um, part of the uh, presentation we uh, we prepared. Um, we prepared two slides about enhanced grid operations. Uh, we, 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 we mentioned a little bit before. Could you briefly explain, please, Cedric? Yeah, uh, so also this is also to show that GTPLC is of course used to retrieve data from point A to point B collect meters in, in, in our smart metering use case, but you can also do much more and that comes, let's say, for free uh, because if you can also um, process uh, data from the meters uh, mm -hmm. and more specifically uh, information about how meters are communicating to each other's neighbors, uh, we call uh, this information is basically uh, contained in neighbor tables, you could use this information to do much more than just data collection, data reading. You can uh, uh, detect power outages uh, in some local uh, localized areas. You could uh, also have a better idea of what your grid cartography looks like, what me what, what meter is connected on, 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 on what feeder. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also uh, detect the face uh, each meter is connected to. So. Uh, these different um, these different features again come for free with GTPLC and it's purely software based. So there's no additional devices that need to be installed in in the grid. So uh, thanks to the uh, nature of PLC that are using electrical lines for signal propagation, you get a lot of more a lot more information that you would get with any other communication technology. Uh, right. So here, really, the key is uh, do data analysis on what you can also learn from a GDPLC communication data from the different meters and devices. Uh, so that's one of the benefits. And on the next slide, uh, so so on the next slide, for example, you could see what was achieved with a grid cartography consolidation use case where on the left side you see uh, different uh, meters that are uh, that, that, that are communicating with each other the, the gray lines are basically a communication that happened between uh, two meters and you can of course analyze this make statistics 
and then if you for example uh, try to compare it with the information you have for example uh, on your existing cartography data and in that example each uh, I mean a meter belongs to a group uh, that is um, that is uh, linked to one that is connected to one or yellow meters, for example, are connected on the same feeder. And here you say that if you if you compare the data obtained from GTPLC and the one you have, you see that there are some errors and you could correct them using GTPLC. So actually GTPLC helped us or helped Enedis to basically uh, correct uh, mm -hmm. some uh, cartography they have, and which was of course uh, of big use when you have something to repair on the grid, something to maintain, right? So a lot of added value. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Cedric. I hope that clarified. Um, and then I think um, the last topic we want to address from our side in the presentation is regarding the uh, the latest development in the G3PLC Alliance is, is that we are developing the first standard for PLC RF hybrid communication. Um, and that's being developed in the technical group. Cedric, you are, are heading. So please, could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so here, um, also this is a trend that could be seen uh, in, the, in the world of PLC, in the world of smart metering. Uh, in, um, it, it has been always a, a struggle between technologies, uh, which technology is, is, is the best one to, to cover a certain use case, smart metering namely. Uh, so GTPLC fights against other PLC standards, also against other RF standards to, to say who is the best technology. But maybe there's also an alternate approach that consists in saying that technologies could be used in a complementary way, uh, so not competing against each other, but basically uh, taking the best from the two worlds. And here we take the best of the GTPLC world and, on the, uh, and from the RF world mm -hmm. by allowing uh, the construction of a hybrid network, a hybrid mesh network where each link could be either uh, negotiated dynamically using PLC or uh, an RF link. And we have developed a solution based on 822.15.4, which is a well-known RF standard, to uh, propose um, a backup link uh, to the primary communication center, which is of course GTPLC, uh, and that would help, of course, to maximize mm -hmm. coverage and resilience of uh, of the whole grid. And again, the selection is done automatically in a completely transparent way, uh, with respect to the application layers. You don't have to worry which link to use, it's done automatically. This is what makes the solution hybrid and that makes the hybrid solution different from a meter that would embed, for example, two different modems that you would have to manage anyways. Also, one advantage of this beyond, uh, let's say, the, 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 the enhancements that you would get from uh, a coverage resilience and even uh, collection performance, uh, that enhanced collection performance would be uh, that this favors a lot of new use cases beyond smart metering. You would also be able to connect mm -hmm. RF-only devices uh, to this network. You would be able to probably do much more because uh, while you would use the grid for communication on, on meters that are on the same grid, you can maybe interconnect connect this with devices that are located in totally different uh, different locations. So. We are working on that. A first specification is now ready and completed, and we are now uh, in the way to demonstrate interoperability and to prepare certification process. So uh, to basically bring it, uh, bring this concept, this hybrid concept, to an industrial uh, solution that could be deployed. And I think it would be of uh, very nice uh, to deploy it. Um, in, in, in new, uh, let's say, in, in new rollouts, or also in addition to existing rollouts, because this solution is completely backwards compatible with any 100% GTPLC um, network. So that's also um, something we, we need to mention here in this webinar. Yeah, and then on your next slide, Cedric, you. Yeah. Including the, 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 the stack you're working on? 
Yeah, indeed, this is the protocol stock, what the protocol stack looks like. So uh, just to say that we <laughs> added uh, uh, two low, the, the lower layers of, of the RF channel. So with A22.15, that 4015 uh, the standard for, for, the, for the physical layer and the MAC layer. And we are uh, having operating now in A63, 870 megahertz band. Of course, uh, additional bands could be added in the future. And all the switching between PLC, between PLC and RF is decided in a dedicated layer, which is called hybrid abstraction layer, just below uh, the 6 fold pan layer, adaptation layer, which will allow, uh, the stand, the, the, let's say, this hybrid solution to completely uh, integrate into the, uh, to the PLC stack we, we, we know of today. And the rest are already mentioned it in the last slide. Okay, I hope that that explains a little bit about the, uh, the the hybrid PLC RF solution we are we are currently working on. Um, before we we have to close the um, the webinar, I think there's one question, Cedric. I hope you can um, briefly address. Um, that is a question having to do with with uh, the network and 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 the and the the, the, the network, um, and it is uh, if my network has a lot of joints in it, is it advisable to use G3PLC? Wouldn't there be a lot of impedance for the successful use of G3PLC in such a network? So the, the question is being if there's a lot of joints, right? So yeah. it. it yeah. Um... Oh, you mean a physical network joints? Yeah, I think okay. that's what meant. Yeah, I I wouldn't expect that uh, the presence of joints would um, would significantly affect propagation of PLC uh, because at the end, what really affects PLC is it's rather the impedance of uh, custom loads and and the number of custom loads and the density of the custom loads. Of course, joints could have technically a little effect, but I would not think that the few, uh, the little effect of these would significantly change, uh, let's say, the, the ability of GTPLC to communicate. Right. So I, I wouldn't expect any <clears throat> issue here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um... So we have a few other specific questions, have you, which we will, which we will answer um, um, later directly with the people posing the questions because they're quite specific. Um, and as we are approaching the um, the end of the hour we reserved for the uh, webinar, um, we'd like to uh, come to the end. We hope we, we answered your questions about G3PLC and, and you will agree that uh, G3PLC is a powerful communication backbone for the, also for the African smart grid. Um, um, G3PLC has proven robustness. It's designed for harsh network conditions. Um, it can enhance your grid operation to address uh, key critical uh, processes in your organization. And, and we are working on, on, on advanced technologies like hybrid communication. Um, like I said before, uh, we have many, many members in the GCPLC Alliance and the members, they work in different working groups in the Alliance to help in the marketing, to help in the technical uh, enhancements of uh, the GCPLC technology. And um, we have different types of members and we also have members uh, which are more into R&D and, and training and, and these can also you can also find these companies on our website which would help you in, 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 in training for G3PLC or doing specific uh, analysis if you if you would need that. Um, to conclude uh, we want to thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing all the, uh, the questions. If you have any further questions, please contact me or one of the other panelists, and we will be happy to answer your questions or to organize a follow-up discussion if you, if you want to. Um, like I said, we will share the presentation, um, and after the webinar, I hope you can take 
a minute to complete a short survey after the webinar. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to meet you again soon at African Utility Week in, in November, hopefully, or some other time soon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.